Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Pingle, and welcome to our April 2018 Hangout. Uh, this month we're talking about local DNS with PFSense 2.4. Uh, through this Hangout, uh, first we'll have project news, like we usually do. Uh, and then we'll have, I'll talk about DNS in general, uh, when you would want to use the firewall for DNS, and then when you wouldn't. Uh, kind of compare and contrast the resolver and forwarder a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about host overrides and domain overrides and how those work. Uh, talk about using DNS with VPNs, DNS with multi-WAN, how DHCP and DNS interact. Uh, when you're using DHCP, how the firewall assigns DNS servers to your clients. And we'll talk about DNS over TLS in general, and then how to configure DNS over TLS for upstream forwarders. And then also how to pr uh, provide DNS over TLS service to local clients if you want. Uh, then intercepting DNS at the firewall if you need to, and a few other miscellaneous uh, little tidbits at the end if, uh, if we have time. All right, for project news this month, um, the, April 2000, the April 2018 IPv6 Bogons list was a little bit too large for the old default table size, um, the 200,000. So it wasn't necessarily tied to the 244 upgrade, but people noticed it around the same time because we released you know, just around the, the time the Bogons updated. So um, if you get a filter load error you know, saying that it can't load the Bogons table, you know, it might prevent other rules from loading. Um, so you can disable the Bogons uh, from all your interfaces, or you can just increase the table entries limit to 400,000. So if you go to System Advanced Firewall and NAT, uh, you can just increase that firewall maximum table entries value to 400,000 and you should be okay. Um, in 244, we're gonna have uh, the uh, uh, the default increase to that 400,000, um, but you know it, it won't hurt anything to increase that now. Um, so, if, but if you aren't using Bogons, you can disable them, but if you are, just increase that value and everything should, should go back to normal. Uh, our Tensor project development is continuing. Uh, we're going to have an image up on AWS in the very near future, so keep an eye on the blog for that. Uh, our PFSense 244 development is also underway. Uh, we're fo pr focusing primarily on uh, FreeBSD 11.2 and uh, PHP 7.2 conversion. Uh, we do have some test packages up for PHP 7.2 uh, because the, the improvements in FreeBSD's uh, ports system with flavors and everything, it's making that really easy for us to transition because uh, we don't have to have a completely separate image for PHP 7.2. You can actually move an existing image over to 7.2 and, and hack away on it. So uh, we're, we're trying to get the worst of it done first and pretty soon we're gonna have uh, uh, like a call for testing kind of thing where we'll have people uh, load, load that up. We'll have instructions on how to switch it over and load that up and, and give it a try. So that's coming pretty soon. So uh, also, you know, if you're running 244 development snapshots, you might want to uh, uh, rethink that, If especially if you're doing that in production. If they're in, in a lab, it's fine. Um, but uh, just be wary that there's going to be some more active development going on there. Uh, so things may be a little bit less stable than usual because they are development snapshots. Uh, normally, our development snapshots are fairly stable anyway, and some people feel that and some people trust them. But um, you know, they are development, and there is going to be a little bit more heavy development going on there, so just be wary. Uh, test it in a lab is always first, and then if it's okay, you can roll one out later. Uh, our XG7100 one units are shipping now, um, so if you were if you had ordered one of those, it should be shipping fairly soon. There is a fairly large back order uh, queue that's that they're working through. So as soon as we as soon as they're coming in and getting built, and they're they're shipping them out. So we're working as fast as we can on those. Uh, but I think there's still a couple of weeks worth of lead time of, of back orders going on there. So uh, just be patient. We're getting through those. We'll get them out to you as soon as we can. Uh, we do have some sales going on this month. Um, our Minoboard Turbo Quad Core and all the lures are on sale. 15% discount with the Makers coupon at checkout. Uh, and the XG1541, there's a 10% discount on that with the NetGate1541 code at checkout. Uh, and that one's good through the end of May. So uh, check those out if you're looking to grab one of those. All right, so um, on to DNS. A little overview, uh, you know, some very, very basic low-level stuff here, uh, or you know, basic stuff. Uh, DNS is short for Domain Name System. Uh, translates host names and IP addresses and, and vice versa. Uh, so, you know, your computers have to talk using IP addresses. They can't talk using names. So they have to resolve those names to addresses. So it makes it easier for humans and devices to to find each other without having to memorize addresses and also helps if, if addresses change for whatever reason. You can, the, the name can be updated to point to a different number and people don't have to know anything changed. 
Um, so for example, you have, you know, like example.com resolves to 203.0.113.65 or, or, you know, or whatever other random number you want to drop in there. Uh, or, you know, just for an example anyway. So uh, there's many different types of, of DNS records. Uh, there's an A record for IPv4. There's a quad A or AAAA for IPv6 addresses. A pointer or PTR for reverse DNS lookups. MX or mail exchange for for uh, for defining where mail goes for a domain. Uh, TXT information records. You'll see those used a lot with uh, uh, things like SPF or Let's Encrypt or ACME kind of things. Uh, C name aliases, which just say, okay, this name really, you should, instead of looking at this name, look at this other name instead, so sort of like an alias. Uh, there's SRV records that are used to locate services, uh, and our package servers use those, for example, uh, for package.pfsense.org. You can't find an A record for it. The client looks up SRV records for the HTTPS TCP service, and then it finds a list of servers to contact that way. Uh, DNS has a hierarchical structure, uh, so your client so we'll talk to either a forwarder or directly to a resolver. Uh, if you talk to a forwarder, that forwarder will in turn talk to you know either another forwarder or uh, on up until a forwarder is talking to a recursive resolver. And then the resolvers will talk to roots and other authoritative servers directly. So they'll go out, they'll talk to the roots, and then they'll find okay, well who owns this domain, and it'll or you know who owns this top level domain, then who owns the domain under that top level domain, and the subdomain under that top level domain, and so on and so forth until it finds an answer. Client queries go over UDP port 53, uh, and it'll ask for a record of a specific type and name and everything. Uh, depending on the size of that result, it might come back over UDP or it might decide to switch to TCP on, also on port 53. Uh, there is a special case for DNS over TLS, uh, which we'll talk about later. That only uses TCP on port 853, uh, never uses UDP, uh, but we'll get, we'll get to that later. So if the forwarder or resolver knows the host locally, or it's got an answer in the cache, um, then it's, it's just going to give that answer back to the client. If it doesn't know the answer, then it's going to take that query and ask somebody upstream whether it's another forwarder or a resolver, depending on your configuration, uh, or, or directly to the roots. Um, and then so it'll the result the, if we get to a resolver, resolver asks the roots for the source of authority, then it will contact other authoritative servers on down the line until eventually it lands at somebody who knows the answer for the for the query. That answer goes you know back to the resolver, then potentially back through multiple other forwarders <laughs> and back down to the client. So uh, it it kind of takes a winding path, but it, it gets where it needs to go. Uh, now, if you're talking to a forwarder, like either the DNS forwarder or the DNS resolver in forwarding mode, that has to eventually talk to either another forwarder or recursive forwarder or recursive resolver. Um, if you're using a resolver like the DNS resolver in resolver mode, uh, that can operate independently and it can talk straight to the root servers and other servers directly. It doesn't have to go through a, a, a third party there. So uh, why would you want to use that firewall for DNS? Well, it's it's pretty easy. It's less effort than running dedicated DNS servers. Um, you, you lose some features because, you know, there's things you could do in bind or power DNS or whatever that you can't do uh, with a resolver or forwarder um, and vice versa. Uh, but most of the time, you know, you're, you're compromising features for convenience and speed. So uh, the resolver is on by default. It works really well. It's easy to configure by the GUI. Uh, you don't have to worry too much. It just kind of just works. Uh, firewall, it's right at the edge of your network. It's really easy to handle your DNS there. You know, it can route it across multiple WANs or VPNs or whatever it needs to do. Uh, it can make some more intelligent decisions about how to control that stuff there. Uh, you could do host and domain overrides at the edge to control responses to clients. So rather than relying solely on what you can publish in public DNS or your clients going straight to Google DNS, they can, they can get their answers from the firewall and, and you can have a little bit more control over what they get. Uh, it can integrate with the DHCP v4 server on PFSense for resolution of uh, IPv4 client host names. Uh, and also, you know, it can cache up all these responses uh, to speed up resolution. So if you have something that's, that gets resolved a lot, like Google.com, you're going to have that answer immediately because it's always going to be in the cache. Um, so that's an advantage using something like a, a, a busy public caching resolver like 8888. You're going to get a lot of queries really fast because everybody's asking for these things and odds are it's already got that answer primed in its cache. Uh, and also um, 
you can more efficiently select upstream DNS servers uh, because it can track multiple servers and multiple forwarders. Uh, it makes a lot smarter decisions than clients do about you know where it gets the responses from. Some clients are getting a little bit smarter about that these days than they used to be. And in fact, I think um, I can't remember. If, I think Mac might actually be using Unbound locally now, uh, but I think Windows 2 has uh, or Windows 10 has also uh, gone with uh, changing the logic there and how it sends out DNS queries. So it used to always be one, two, three, you know, wait for one, one fails, it goes to two, two fails, it goes to three, you know, so on and so forth. But I think they've made some changes there. But uh, the firewall still, you know, it's a little bit, but a little bit more predictable, a little bit more uh, reliable. So when wouldn't you want to use the firewall for DNS? Well, um, if you have really complicated requirements, so you have multiple sites sharing the same domain name, you know, I've got to have the same host, host names from everybody on multiple sites all in the same DNS structure, you know, it's not something the firewall is going to be able to handle for you unless you manually manage everything, which is kind of ugly. Um, you could, you know, when you need to provide different responses to different sets of local clients like views, um, you can sort of fudge that a little bit if you try and run the resolver and the forwarder at the same time with different host overrides, but it's really not great. Um, you can also, if you have clients that must register their host names in different domains on the same local segment, uh, you know, that's, that's not going to work here either. Um, or, you know, the most popular thing is if you've got Active Directory. Um, you know, if you've got Active Directory, you want your clients talking straight to AD for your DHCP and DNS. Sure, you can kind of make it work otherwise, but it's it's a lot tougher on the clients if they're not talking to your Active Directory structure directly. Now, you know, you can always set your, your forwarders in the Active Directory DNS server so they will talk to the firewall. So it goes clients to Active Directory, Active Directory to your firewall, and your firewall out. Um, that way you could still use your host and domain overrides on the firewall or whatever other DNS trickery or routing you want to do. Um, you can sort of get the best of both worlds that way. Uh, plus, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, any kind of other weirdness from, from the clients not talking to AD for their DNS. And the last one is for, for providing authoritative answers to public clients. You really don't want to do that on the firewall. I mean, we do have a bind package and it's pretty flexible, but I'm still, I, I, I'm of the, uh, of the mindset that I, do, I would not want to be running a public authoritative DNS server on my firewall. Now, maybe if you set up another instance as an appliance type thing uh, and you've got an isolated, sure, if you want to do that, fine, but uh, I wouldn't do that on your firewall. So uh, the DNS resolver, which is unbound under the hood, um, it's been the default for a long time from since PSNs 2.2. Uh, and we're you know we're constantly you know uh, improving it here and there as we go. Um, and unbound is a, a secure caching resolver. It's used in FreeBSD. Uh, it's been built in there for quite a while now. Um, and unbound can operate independently. Uh, it doesn't need manually configured upstream DNS servers because it works as a resolver. So it'll talk to the roots, which talk to authoritative servers on down the line. So uh, you don't have to define anything in your forwarding servers and it's, it's, it's better out of the box behavior. Uh, so, you, you know, you fire up your firewall. You don't have to worry about going and configuring DNS servers. You don't have to worry about getting them from DHCP or PPPoE. It's just going to work for you. Um, so the only time you might really have an issue is if your ISP is filtering or rate limiting what you could reach with DNS. Uh, you know, years ago, back in the 2.2 days, we did hear some reports where people were saying, you know, I, I can't work in resolver mode because I can't reach these routes or I can't get answers or it'll work for a bit and then stop. Um, and they could only use it in forwarding mode. And we haven't had that many reports of that lately. So I think maybe ISPs are sort of relaxing those requirements as they realize, you know, people's DNS needs are changing. Another thing about resolver mode, uh, multi-WAN can be tricky. Uh, because you're talking to the roots, all these things are going to take the default route. And using the roots and other authoritative servers, you can't predict what's going to take which WAN. So really, uh, there's no way to nudge things one way or the other. You can use default gateway switching to kind of get there, which I'll mention a little bit, but um, it's, still, it's still not perfect. Now, now, resolver, uh, sorry, the DNS resolver unbound, you can also turn on forwarding mode, and it, so it can work sort of like the old DNS forwarder did, which we'll go to. Um, so you can go, uh, all of your DNS servers are defined under system in general setup, um, but it will select one sort of at random, uh, you know, based on, not really at random, but based on the st statistics it's tracking. It decides which one to use. 
So if one is slow or if one's down, it'll it'll use a different one. It, it tracks stats on all the available servers, so it doesn't always query every server. So it's kind of a little bit less predictable than forwarder. And if you have, um, I'll show you here, if you ha if you do a query, like let me just look up Google here, and then you if you then you tell it unbound control to do a lookup for root, it'll tell you exactly what it's going to do. And if you dump the infrastructure cache, it gives you a little bit more stats. So it shows you you know what servers it's talking to um, <clears throat> for that query or which ones it, it recently talked to, and uh, you know the port number it's using, time to live. It gives you a you know response time, and a few other stats about uh, if, if it provided bad information that it, that it knows is bad, that kind of stuff. So internally, it tracks all these, and then it decides which one, which query, or which uh, forwarder to actually respond from, or use the response from, based on the stats. And if you're on 244, we have added uh, status DNS resolver here, which which gives you the same information from the, the dump infra cache or the infrastructure cache. Uh, it just sort of splits it into two lines and make it a little bit easier to see, or into two tables to make it a little easier to see. So uh, Unbound can also easily use the domain name system security extensions or DNSSEC for secure DNS. Uh, so DNSSEC provides authentication and integrity confirmation. Uh, so it makes sure that you're seeing the right stuff. Uh, it, it, don't, it makes sure people don't forge the responses. So if you get a DNSSEC enabled response, you know that it came from the right place and that it's the right record. Um, so it just makes sure that things are correct. Uh, it does not do encryption. Um, now, DNSSEC is going to always work in resolver mode. Uh, but if you're on forwarding mode, it, it will only work if your forwarder supports DNSSEC as well. So that is, uh, that's a little bit something you have to be aware of if you need to use forwarding mode. Uh, the resolver also supports DNS over TLS for DNS query privacy, so for encryption there. And it can, out, it can act as either an upstream TLS forwarder client or a server for local TLS clients. And we'll talk about both of those. Uh, uh, there are many options uh, under the advanced options for tuning, optimization, and privacy. You can tune how it behaves in the cache, and uh, we'll talk about some of the privacy options in a little bit, too. Uh, now, the resolver also scales better for large numbers of clients. Uh, the performance is optimized a bit better. Now, I know uh, the forwarder has a little bit lighter thing we'll talk about, but uh, Unbound is a little bit heavier, but when it, it scales better. So it it ends up uh, working out better or in your favor for a larger deployment. Uh, it also has better security and access control, a little bit more fine-grained control. Now, in contrast, their DNS forwarder, which is no longer the default, it was years ago, it uses DNS mask, which is a lightweight caching DNS forwarder. It's a forwarder only, it cannot be a resolver. Uh, now, it requires that you have your upstream DNS servers put either under you know, system and general setup, or you get them from DHCP or PPPoE, uh, or you know some other dynamic interface way. Um, and now by default, the forwarder will send a query to every server you have configured all at once, and whichever one comes back fastest, that's the answer it passes back to the client. Um, so that's very robust. Uh, it, it really will get you a, a query response the fastest, um, but um, if you have your servers intentionally in a specific order, like you always want queries from one to be preferred, it sort of undermines that. Um, but, you know, there's better ways to work around that sort of issue. Um, and it does, because it works well with multi-win, because you have all your servers defined and your servers can have gateways set, uh, so you can control what goes out where. Now, both the resolver and the forwarder support host overrides, and they work the same way in both of them. So this, this is the same in both. So you have you can have an override is a custom DNS, uh, either an uh, A record for IPv4, quad A for IPv6, uh, and that returns either an answer for a host that doesn't exist in upstream DNS, or it'll override an upstream response with a custom local response. So 
you could define local servers that only exist on your local network, maybe something's in your DMZ, uh, or a testing server of some sort, staging lab type thing. Uh, you can use it for VPN hosts, you, uh, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, you can override responses for split DNS, like say your, the public resolves your website to your WAN address, which gets NAT forwarded into a web server that's local. Uh, you can make it so that your local DNS resolves that local web server directly, so it doesn't have to hit the firewall for anything, it just goes right over to it, or it doesn't have to rely on NAT reflection or anything, anything of the sort. You can also do some mild blocking with it, like you could uh, set up bogus response for Facebook, uh, that you know where it will return or a response with a like local host or whatever for Facebook to kind of kill that too. Uh, now host overrides that can have multiple aliases, which is just a shortcut to uh, let you define uh, more than one host name that resolves to the same IP address, uh, rather than having multiple entries uh, all pointing to the same place. It's a little bit more convenient that way. Uh, if, every, if you have like five host names on one server and then you need to change the IP address of that server, you only have to update one host override record instead of five. Now, domain overrides are a little bit different uh, on both of them. Uh, they sort of work the same way, but they each have slightly different options. Um, now, domain override lets you put a, select a different upstream server on a per domain basis. So. Uh, if you always want to send all of your internal AD queries to an AD server, maybe across a VPN, uh, you could do it that way. You set up an override for that domain, aim it at your, your AD server, for example. Um, so any query that goes for a, a host under that domain will be sent to the domain name or to the override server you configured. So uh, it's pretty useful for, for redirecting things as well. Um, say you've got three ISP servers or something, and you know, maybe one of them you know you don't like the you don't like how it returns records for something. Maybe uh, you have two different public resolvers, and one doesn't give you the right responses you want for say YouTube or something uh, that's in a different region. Uh, you could you know use a domain override for YouTube to send that to a different resolver. You know something like that. You can you can pull off all sorts of trickery with it. Not even not related to only internal things. Uh, you can also use in the DNS resolver, um, uh, you can enable DNS over TLS selectively per domain. Um, so if you don't have it enabled globally, you can set it so that uh, they are, uh, you can do DNS over TLS just for one domain override or vice versa. Or if, you, if you've got DNS, DNS over TLS for everybody, you can set a domain override to not use it. So uh, it's really, you know, really flexible up to you. You can do that whichever way you want. Um, the forwarder can set a source address for the queries, though, which is a little bit different than uh, what the what the resolver can do, because the forwarder can set a different source address for every domain override, and that really helps a lot with IPsec, uh, because you have to make sure your source is within a local P2, which we'll talk about with VPNs here in a minute. So the DNS resolver can set a, an outgoing address globally, but not on a per domain basis. Uh, so it's a little bit trickier to pull some of the same things off with the resolver that you can do with the forwarder pretty simply. Uh, the forwarder can also do things like exceptions for subdomains to pass them onto normal DNS. Um, so like example.com could be redirected to a local server, but blah.example.com could go out to a public server. Uh, or uh, you could set a, a domain name to be queried only locally, not elsewhere. Uh, but the, and you can't do that in the in the resolver. Uh, let's see. You can also define a domain name multiple times with the ser uh, with a different server IP address each way. That way you get redundancy. Then it'll it'll go off the same kind of uh, redundancy you get with forwarding mode. So Unbound will track both multiple servers and pick whichever one it thinks the query will get back back from first. Um, and uh, the forwarder will query them all at the same time and take the first response. All right, a little bit more in depth on VPNs and in DNS on the firewall. Um, so if you have a VPN, you've got a private link, you know, you're connecting multiple sites, uh, your domain overrides will let you query the other sites over the VPN if you want, but um, each site's gonna have to use a different domain or subdomain. Um, so if everything's under example.com, that's not going to work because each one has separate sets of records for example.com and it won't know that if it's not local to go to the other one. 
Uh, but if you got site1.example.com and site2.example.com, then if, it, if you're on site one, you get a, a request for something.site2.example.com. It knows that it can send that to the server over the VPN at site two and vice versa. It'll work both ways, as long as you use different domains or subdomains. Uh, if you're looking at OpenVPN, your connectivity for the queries is, is going to be pretty smooth because OpenVPN is routed. Um, it's going to send those queries out from the tunnel network on the firewall or on the interface, um, unless you manually set an outgoing address or interface in the forwarder or resolver. Uh, that can override that. But by default, it'll go out the tunnel network of the VPN. Um, so on your other side, on the receiving server, you might have to account for how that query is sourced. Uh, if you so like your DNS ACLs may not include your your tunnel network on the firewall, for example, you may have to add add a firewall rule or an ACL on your DNS server to account for that. So if you're using the DNS forwarder in IPsec, um, in your domain overrides, you can set that source address, like I mentioned. And you, when you do set that, you want to make sure that if it's with uh, it, it's using an address that's inside an I, the, a local side of your IPsec P2. So if you've got an IPsec P2 built from your LAN network to some remote network, uh, set your domain override uh, source address to be your firewall's LAN IP address, for example. Now, if you're using the resolver instead of the forwarder, um, you can set the outgoing query interface. And if you lock that into the LAN or some other local interface, then that will use that as a source. And, uh, and that will still work going out WAN as well, because uh, the firewall will, even though it's sourced from the LAN address, it'll go out through NAT and, and naturally reach out where it needs to go. And it, it doesn't really break uh, anything that I'm aware of. So uh, that's fine to do it that way if you, if you need to, uh, or uh, just, to, just to be able to force that over IPsec. There's another gateway and static route trick you can do. We've got that on the wiki. Uh, you can go through that route trick if you want to, but we don't recommend doing that. It's just a lot of work and the very little benefit in this case. If you have other services that need it, sure. But for DNS, there's use the outgoing query interface and, or the domain override way uh, with forwarder and you're good. Um, if you want to send every single DNS query through your VPN to the other side, that uh, can be accommodated, but it's a little trickier. In the resolver, you have to use forwarding mode and you have to put that server into a system in general, and then you have to make sure you disable DNS from DHCP and PPPoE. Um, forwarder is similar. You know, you have to configure your DNS servers there. Um, in either case, you know, you want to only bind to your LAN or use the, the LAN for the outgoing query interface to make sure that you're sourcing that traffic correctly. Um, and also, you need to make sure your VPN doesn't need DNS to connect, because if you're forcing all of your DNS over the VPN, you can't resolve the host name of the VPN server because it'll try to query that VP the try to do a DNS query for the VPN host address, then find oh well I need to send that over the VPN but the VPN's not up, <laughs> and you get caught in a vicious cycle there. Now there might be some ways around that, but uh, it's usually not worth the trouble to go go through all that and just uh, you know just use an address uh, if if you can anyway. Right. For multi-WAN, uh, the resolver and the forwarder can both be compatible with multi-WAN. Um, by default, the resolver queries the random root servers, like I mentioned, and other authoritative servers. And that mode is not going to work without gateway switching. You can do your option one's gateway switching. Um, so you have uh, just go under system advanced miscellaneous tab, <clears throat> and you can enable default gateway switching there. And how that works is, you know, your primary WAN, your default route is is up. It'll use that. If that goes down, it'll pick the next one in the list. And we've got a patch coming that we're hoping to get into 244. Uh, there's a pull request out there where you can actually set up um, a default group. Uh, so you can set your preference for what gateways can be used for uh, default gateway switching and the preference in which they're, the order in which they will be used. So uh, that'll be pretty slick when we get that in. Uh, as opposed to now, it's just it just goes down the list, uh, and it you know it can even it can pick something that's not even a WAN gateway. So you have to be really careful using that. Uh, option two with the DNS resolver is to enable forwarding mode. Uh, go to System General Setup, configure a DNS server, and then you you'll pick whichever WAN that's supposed to go out. Um, let me show you how that works here. 
So see here, I've got four DNS servers defined and I've got two of them going out my WAN and two of them set to go out WAN two. And normally this is by default that that is set to none. Um, so it will just go out the default route. Uh, but if you lock them into a specific WAN, then those queries are all go going to that server will always go out that particular WAN. So uh, that makes it better for multi-WAN because if you're, if a WAN goes down, um, you know, it'll still have connectivity to the DNS servers that are routed over your other WAN. Super easy. Um, for the DNS forwarder, same as option two. Configure your DNS servers like I just showed you, set appropriate gateways. And uh, if you don't use the resolver or the forwarder, that's another option you have. You know, if you on your clients just put in like your your upstream forwarder address directly. Some people put like 8888 and 8844 on their clients directly, and those clients will query that DNS server, hit policy routing, and go out whichever way you want. Okay. Oh, somebody's got a question. They don't understand why you have to turn on default gateway switching for resolver and multi WAN. So. Um, you need default gateway switching because say your WAN one is your primary WAN, that's your de that's your firewall's default route. When the resolver tries to send a query to the roots, that's going to go out the default route, um, and it will only go out the default route. If that default route is down, say your WAN one goes down but WAN two is still up, the firewall has no way to know that oh I need to go send that out WAN two now because the the default route is still out WAN one even though it's down, it'll just hit a brick wall. It won't go anywhere. So you need default gateway switching to for the firewall to be able to tell itself, okay, now my default gateway is WAN2. I switch to WAN2, then all your queries will go out to the root servers over WAN2, do whatever it needs to do. You know, WAN1 comes back up, default switches back to WAN1. So yeah, if it's it's only needed for, for failover, it's not gonna help you with load balancing. Uh, if you need to load balance your DNS queries, uh, you'd have to use forwarding mode. Uh, you know, otherwise everything's going to always go out your default gateway in resolving mode. Full screen here for a second. Okay, well, we're talking about DHCP and DNS servers. Um, both resolver and the folder can register uh, DHCP host names and dynamic and static IPv4 leases. Uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier, um, it keeps a watch on the leases file and when it sees a host name or host name change to a host name come in it, it registers that uh, in the in the host that could be used by the forwarder and resolver so you can resolve those things automatically um, because of the way the DHCP v6 daemon works that you know it doesn't even track host names in the in the leases uh, so that same trick won't work for that so at the moment we don't have a way to do that directly on the firewall but both the v4 and v6 DHCP servers can register host names to a an external DNS server. You know when the, when the lease events happen. So uh, that's an that's an alternative if you need to resolve v6 uh, hosts is to have an external DNS server like a bind server with dynamic zones set up and and go that way. Um, the domain that used by that feature is the domain of the firewall itself, not the domain configured in DHCP options, uh, because you know it's it's a global setting. There's no uh, there's not a way in the leases file for it to easily tell where it's coming from. So we've we've tried a few different ways to kind of work around that, but uh, eventually we'll find a way to to lock that down. But at the moment we haven't uh, we haven't found a way that uh, that we we've, we've been happy with. Um, so. When these leases happen, the clients supply their own host name um, it, it, with a dynamic lease, or you have static leases uh, or static mappings that you've set up. We will use the configured host name there, um, and whatever address you, whatever address you put in. Um, so, but if a client provides an invalid or a blank host name, it's not going to resolve. Um, I haven't seen one lately, but a while back we had some people with like iOS devices. I think it was that had like weird stuff in the in a host name that shouldn't have been in a host name, like uh, heart symbols or a uh, less than greater than numbers, things like that. That you know, it just in the wrong order for a host name, and it was invalid in DNS, and so it would it would reject it. And they wonder why the host name doesn't resolve. Well, it doesn't resolve because it's not a valid host name. So yeah, you need to make sure that your clients are sending good data. Uh, you also need to make sure that when you're using a domain directly, uh, like if you just got example.com on your firewall and not like uh, site1.example.com, um, if you're if if a host name 
sends its name as www, it might actually override your existing web server and it could do some tricky stuff there. So again, it goes back to making sure your client data is good and, and, and having some best, best practices to make sure they can't uh, change that stuff. Another caveat here in HA, if you've got an HA cluster, um, you know, your DHCP servers, even though they exchange lease information, the host names are not exchanged between the nodes. So uh, that's something in uh, ISC needs to take care of upstream in DHCPD. I thought they, I thought we had a fix for that uh, not terribly long ago, but I, when I tried it uh, earlier this week, it still didn't have the host names shared. So something to be on the lookout for. Now, when you're using DHCP and assigning DNS servers to clients, there's some logic behind what gets sent out. And some people are get confused by exactly what gets sent when. Um, so if you have DNS servers set in your DHCP settings, those are the ones that will always be sent to clients. If there's nothing in the DHCP settings for DNS, then it looks to see if your resolver or forwarder are enabled. If, it do, if, they, if one of them is enabled, it sends the IP address of the firewall to clients. If neither of them are enabled, are enabled if, they're both, if they're both disabled, uh, it will send the DNS servers that you have defined under system general setup. And if that's empty, then it doesn't send anything to clients. For, D, for DNS. So you have to be manually configured in that case. Though I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody run that way because <laughs> the firewall itself wouldn't have any working DNS. So, all right. So uh, let's get into the the hot topic of the, of the day is uh, DNS over TLS, which uh, it's gained some momentum lately because Cloudflare and Quad9 are both doing it. And it's, it's, uh, a good thing. Uh, DNS over TLS allows clients and servers to communicate privately. Uh, so nobody can intercept the body of the client or of the query. So your, your ISP or link in between you or anywhere along the way between you and the DNS server um, can't be sniffed or have its uh, answers manipulated. Um, we've heard about some cases, uh, especially in uh, less reputable uh, governments that <laughs> Will uh, we'll, we've seen DNS queries be changed? You know, like uh, what you what you asked for from your forwarder upstream is not actually what what they responded with. is not actually what made it back to you. That sort of stuff. So things to be aware of. You know, or you know, some anybody in, in between could be logging your DNS query data, maybe aggregating that, selling it to uh, marketing companies, that kind of stuff. So also things to be aware of. But if you do DNS over TLS they can't see anything. They can see that you're communicating to a, DH, to a DNS server, but they can't see the contents of the query. Uh, so DNS over TLS and, and DNSSEC complement each other because they each solve a different problem. Uh, DNS over TLS is privacy, DNSSEC is authenticity. Um, so you want ideally you want both. So DNS over TLS, obviously by the name, uses TLS certificates uh, in PKI, public key, public key infrastructure. So similar to HTTPS and other similar services that use TLS, maybe like a you know, IMAP, SMTP, uh, lots of stuff out there is using TLS these days. Uh, queries for DNS over TLS use port 853 and only TCP, it's never UDP. Uh, it's a standards, DNS over TLS is standards based. It's an RFC 7858 and 8310. Uh, so it's not a proprietary solution like DNS crypt. Uh, and, and DNS over TLS is supported by Unbound at the moment uh, in either as a client or a server and a growing number, number of other DNS related software packages will do it. Although it's not extremely common yet. Uh, Google has said that Android P is gonna have DNS over TLS natively when it's, a, when when it's available, if it's, or, or sorry, we'll prefer it when it's available, uh, but it's still going to be configurable. Like you could manually turn it off, but by default, it's going to, it's going to try to look for it. And if it's there, it'll use it. So that's the reason why you might want to consider uh, running a DNS over TLS server on your local network, because those clients will use it automatically. And especially over uh, like open Wi-Fi, that'll, that'll help out your, your clients for a little bit extra privacy. Now, your upstream forwarding DNS servers, obviously, if you're going to do this, have to support DNS over TLS. So, uh, and support for that is still pretty rare, but I'll, I'll give you a provider list here in a minute. Um, obviously, in DNS resolver, it requires forwarding mode because otherwise, you know, all of the routes and every authoritative server out in the world would all have to support DNS over TLS, and we're just not there yet. Um, so you, you have to talk to a forwarder upstream from you that does DNS over TLS, and then it will send out 
the query and uh, and work its way down from there. So because you have to do, you have to trust the substream forwarder. Uh, so you, because you have to use that forwarder, not the roots. You, so you still have to trust it. They can still see your queries, and in the absence of DNSSEC, they can manipulate responses. So you have to trust that they're not going to be logging or doing anything nefarious with your data, uh, with your queries. So whether or not you trust whether or not you trust them, that's up to you. Uh, because even if an intermediary can't see your DNS requests, um, you know, there's still other ways that they can glean some information about your traffic. So say your ISP uh, or somewhere along the, the, the path between you and the Internet in general is compromised or being sniffed in some way by, by some entity. Um, even if you're doing DNS over TLS and HTTPS, they can still get some information about your connection. Um, if you send a TLS or a, uh, an HTTPS request to a web server, your browser is going to send an SNI header to tell it what domain name it wants from the web server so it can select a proper certificate and route it to the right virtual host kind of deal. Um, but that is sent in the clear, and it could still be intercepted along the way. So uh, even if uh, even if you are using all of these privacy things, it's not necessarily a full replacement for a VPN if there is anywhere untrusted on your path between you and, say, a VPN server, uh, you know, or another country, whatever, you know, uh, you need to be a little bit more careful. So it helps. It's better than nothing, but it's not a perfect replacement for, for something with, with stronger security and privacy. Another downside, uh, there's some session setup overhead, so it can be much slower than traditional DNS. Uh, it uses TCP fast open, uh, so it's a, a quicker than a regular TCP handshake, but it still does have to have uh, a little bit of overhead involved there with setting up sessions and session management, uh, so something to be aware of. Uh, the effect is minimized for popular queries since they're answered from the cache, uh, but still it's a potential for a loss of performance there. Public provider supports limited, primarily Cloudflare and Quad9, though I've got a list on the next slide here that'll, uh, or a link to a list uh, for some others that are in different regions. Uh, a lot of your utilities like uh, Drill and Dig, you know, they don't have support for TLS yet, so you can't really diagnose it or troubleshoot it as easily. Uh, I know there's there's one I know, uh, KDIG from not DNS, it can, it can test DNS over TLS, uh, but whether or not you can find that on your distribution or a, a local binary to run is, is a much harder question to answer. Okay, so before you start doing DNS over TLS, you have to know where you're going to get your answers from, uh, whether or not you want to use Cloudflare or Quad9 or both. Um, they each have primary and secondary servers, and also, they also have IPv6 servers available. So uh, you can note down as many of these as you want, or just one from each or two from each or whatever. Uh, or you can even roll your own if you want to set up a DNS over TLS server somewhere like in a co-location facility. Uh, there's a list here on this link at dnsprivacy.org um, that actually has, a, it's got a list to some in different regions that, that support DNS over TLS and other security uh, features and a breakdown of what they support where, which is pretty handy to know. Um, so whichever way you try to go, make a note of the servers you want to use and keep them nearby. because uh, there's a couple different ways you can get this done. Um, number one, you have to use a resolver for this. So if you're using the DNS forwarder, you're going to have to shut that down and turn on the resolver instead. Uh, you're going to have to go to DNS servers in, under system in general and plug, plug them in. Like here, I've got uh, the two for Cloudflare and the two for Quad9. And if you're using multi-win, pick appropriate gateways. I've got them set up over here too. Oh, that one keeps logging me out. System general setup. Yeah, see, I've just got cloud. I've just got quad nine on this one. So uh, in two four three over here, um, you have to go to services and then DNS resolver, and uh, make sure you and then uh, show your custom options here, and then plug these options into the custom options box. Uh, first, you've got the server line, which you always need to have in there to make sure it's in the right context, because depending on what other options you set up in Unbound, it may be in a different context. So you always have to put it back into the server context. Then you set a forward zone for dot or root, which is the root zone. So that means send all queries here 
or everything that doesn't have another exception. Then forward SSL upstream is yes to turn on DNS over TLS. And then all of these forward addresses are just the, the addresses of the various DNS servers that support DNS over TLS uh, with a suffix of an at sign and then the port number, which is 853. And as you can see here, I've got uh, what I have set here matches what I have set on system general setup. I've got the two for Cloudflare and the two for Quad9. And it's even easier on 244 if you just go into uh, system DNS resolver, or sorry, services and DNS resolver. Uh, all you have to do is uh, enable forwarding mode and enable SSL TLS for outgoing queries. That's it. It'll do the rest for you. Uh, you can run a test and confirm, like what I showed you earlier. You can see it's sending these to port 853 when I, when I, when I did that query. And that's a good indication. Uh, you can check your state table on the firewall to make sure you see uh, queries only going to 853 on the forwarding server. And you can take a packet capture of uh, port 853 and, and see what's going on there. Make sure that what you're seeing is encrypted. Um, so, you know, definitely make sure that you're sending your queries out, the queries out as you expect. Um, and you can, you won't see that in the lookup. It doesn't show you the port number there, but if you do dump infra, that's where it will show you the port number. And again, that dump infra also shows up. Let me make sure that something's primed in the cache here. Uh, if you go to status DNS resolver on 244, you'll see the 853 there as well. Now, if you want to provide DNS over TLS to local clients, it's super easy on 244. You can set it up on 243. There's some instructions on the on the Redmine ticket I've linked here, but I'm only going to show you 244. Getting a little low on time. Um, so if we go to services and DNS resolver, you can enable uh, SSL TLS service. Uh, pick a certificate, which if you got a Let's Encrypt certificate, that works perfectly fine. Uh, or just even just pick your regular GUI certificate. That's okay, too. Your listen port, just leave that at 853. I mean, you could move it if you wanted to, but clients are going to expect it on 853. And then save, and that's it. That's just a checkbox, pick a cert, that's it. Super, super simple. Now, unrelated to DNS over TLS, but something else you might want to do for client for clients uh, is to make sure that they're using your DNS and nobody else's. Um, you can intercept their DNS queries so that uh, when a client sends a request to any DNS server, even one that's not on your network, it will get redirected into, into the firewall and its DNS server. So uh, how you do that is you, you have your interface, you put a port forward on a local interface. So firewall, NAT, on the port forwards, you make a new entry, set it for your local interface, uh, protocol TCP UDP, you wanna check invert match, and then say this firewall is better to use, or you could just do LAN address that way, or you know whatever their interface address is that they're on. And that means you know, anything that's not in the firewall, it'll get redirected. Uh, port destination ports at DNS, redirect is local host and DNS. And that's it, you know, if they send the DNS query to the firewall, it'll go to the firewall. If they send it to anywhere else, it will get redirected by NAT to the firewall. Um, and that's that's good to use in some in some ways, especially on uh, like a corporate environment where you want to make sure everybody's using the correct DNS responses. Even if they have something wacky configured on their local machines, it's still going to redirect it back to you. Um, but if you're in a public environment, that may not be kosher because people may not expect their DNS to be intercepted, which is the kind of thing like DNS over TLS is meant to prevent. So <laughs> uh, depending on whether or not your uh, the client validates DNS over TLS, right, they may not know they're being redirected to, which uh, could be unexpected. Another privacy option that we have available in um, in the GUI in 244, or you can manually put it into the configuration on 243, is in the advanced settings of the DNS resolver, we have query name minimization. Now what that does, um, it tries to minimize the amount of information it puts into a DNS query. So the DNS server will see as little as possible about what you need to know. Uh, so it tries to craft these queries in a little bit more strict way than, than it would otherwise. Um, 
it's covered by RFC 7816 if you want to know the actual implementation details. Um, but uh, I don't really have time to get into the whole thing there. Um, but it's it's good for privacy because it, it tries to make sure you're not sending out too much with every DNS query. Um, so on 244, you can just check query name minimization on the advanced tab. 243 and your custom options under the ser under the server line, you can just add Q name minimization, the British way of spelling it, not the American way of spelling it, uh, colon yes. Uh, and there is also a stricter mode yet for DNS query minimization, and I don't recommend doing that, or we don't recommend doing that, just because there are some domains that will absolutely fail to resolve with that, even though they're valid. I think some Microsoft domains I've heard, uh, like stuff under TechNet or MSDN or something, would fail because it, it expects it to see uh, things it doesn't get in that mode. Uh, something else you can do is DNS rebinding protection. Uh, by default, it doesn't let you do private uh, private responses from public domains if you're receiving upstream queries, and you can add overrides on a per domain basis for that, like I've shown here. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can look at the if you're interested in that, you can look at the uh, example there and follow that in the config if you need it. Uh, you can do. A, I showed you like the dump info and the lookup command uh, for unbound control. Uh, but you can also do a few other things that are interesting, like you can use dump cache to look at the entire DNS cache. Uh, you can use flush zone to clear out the cache for a, a zone. Um, and if you pass it a dot for the zone, like flush underscore zone dot, it will flush everything from your cache, which is a little bit faster and smoother than uh, stopping and restarting the daemon, but it'll work. And you can also see some some performance data and stats with stats no reset. And I'm trying to find a way to fit that the stats data into the GUI on that status page, but so far I haven't found any way to do it that I like. It's just kind of it's a ton of information, which is not a really great way to represent that uh, without just dumping it all, which is not very nice. Uh, so that's all I really have time to go through today. Uh, looks like we got one question already. Uh, so if you, if you have another question, go ahead and start typing it now. Uh, let's see. Somebody says, could the redirect be used to force all requests to go through an internal server or just use inverse match for the internal DNS server IP? Yes, uh, you can do that. Um, you just need to make sure that, uh, well, yes and no. Because if it's on a different interface, like if your DNS server is on a DMZ and your clients are on LAN, that works okay. Um, if your LAN clients and your DNS server are on the same subnet, if you try to redirect that way, um, it's going to break the responses because the server will respond straight to the client, not back through the firewall. So you can work around that with some outbound NAT. Uh, you can make it so that if a query is going back out to your DNS server, it gets an outbound NAT so it looks like it came from the firewall. That's kind of ugly, but I mean, you can do it that way, but it's a lot easier if you dump your DNS server into a DMZ and uh, make sure your client queries get redirected over to the DMZ interface instead. Uh, that works just fine. But yeah, you can do that. Just same with the redirecting any service uh, works. But uh, I know the, the squid redirect, for example, sort of happens that way. And we tell people the same thing about if you have a proxy, you know, you want to redirect it locally. It really needs to be either on localhost or a DMZ. Uh, but you can work around it without bound net, but it's not too clean. Any other questions? I got time for another, maybe one more question or two. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, well, I guess that's it for this month. Uh, if you do come up with any other questions, you can fire them off on uh, the forum or the, or the PFSense subreddit or find another way to reach us and we'll see if we can answer your questions. And uh, join us back here next month. Uh, we'll uh, have an, another new exciting topic to talk about. If you have any ideas for Hangout topics, you can drop us a note, like I said, on the forum, comment on the blog, post, Reddit, uh, whatever. Uh, one way or another, get a note to us. We'll see if it's viable. And uh, we'll see you back here next month. Thank you for joining us.